thank you uh, very much, Razvan, for arranging all of this. And thanks, everyone, from wherever you are uh, tuning in um, to hear about the, the floor of the Silk Road. This is, I know some of you have um, this book that I produced with my wife, Bashek, a few years ago about this uh, wonderful, wonderful um, region um, that stretches between the Mediterranean and Asia. Um, but I should really, to begin with, we'll just uh, kind of define really what and where it was before we go wandering along it. It was uh, an 8,000 kilometer long trade route, which linked uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, essentially the Roman Empire with China via um, Syria, Iran and Central Asia. And as you can see from this graphic, if you look carefully, it's a whole network, a web of, of roads, routes. It was never just one, one road. I mean, that term was coined by uh, a German geographer in, at the end of the 19th century. And it wasn't even just silk. Lots of other commodities and ideas and religions and all sorts of things. Armies and all sorts of stuff went up and down the Silk Road. And the different routes themselves uh, changed with their emphasis and, and which were used and when, depending on the political situation or, or, or whatever. And um, it all began, so it said, with, with the Romans actually being defeated by the Parthians at the Battle of Carhe, and the Parthians unfurled these great silk banners uh, to taunt the Romans, and the Romans were transfixed by this wonderful, lustrous material. Where can we get our hands on this? And within, you know, within a century, there was a very well-established uh, route linking these two empires, which never actually met. Uh, and all the trade was carried out by intermediaries passing goods up and down the line. Uh, and this all went on, you know, in, in varying degrees until around the 16th century, when basically the European uh, maritime powers uh, chose sea routes, much more profitable for them and, and cutting out all the middlemen in the Silk Road. And things pretty much declined quite quickly after that. Um, and I've marked a couple of the main towns there. You've got obviously Istanbul, um, uh, Tehran, Samarkand and Jan. These are all some of the main centers, but it really did spread out across much of Asia. Now, as I've alluded to, you were linking different cultures. You had the Roman culture with these fantastic sort of uh, Mediterranean cities such as Bosra in Syria. And it passed through Central Asia with this extraordinary blue tide architecture you had certainly in the sort of 13th, 14th century. And then we had the nomads on the steppes of places like Kazakhstan and finally quite advanced, technically advanced China, which was producing all this wonderful silk and other things, compasses and, and all sorts. But we are here obviously to talk about flowers and this route, this silk road, covers about 50,000 species of plant, which is a fair number to try and get your head around. And so what I'd like to do, what, what seems to work well, is if we kind of highlight a few different genera and groups of plants, which are more or less present in some form along the silk road everywhere, although their importance, their, their prominence varies depending on where you are. And in that way, actually, you can tell where you are on the silk road to some degree. Now, I've chosen for this iris, um, fritillaria, anemones, primulas. We've got the foxtail lilies, the Arimurus there, things like corydalis, and then other plants like arums, the aroid, different sort of arums we find, and orchids. So we'll pick up on those as we go through and we'll see how they vary and, and, and how important they are in the different places. Now, I, where I'm sitting right now, strangely enough, is where I actually began my Silk Road journey. And this, this particular journey we're going on is not going to be just a solemn plod from west to east. I like to jump around a bit and represent it as how we actually put this project together, our own Silk Road journey. And um, there was quite a lot of toing and froing, so it'll test your geography just a touch. Um, but my whole, my whole uh, sort of um, fascination with the region really started in Antalya, in Turkey, in the, in the Mediterranean. Um, when I undertook my very first botanical trip, and although I was somewhat full of myself, being a, having been a horticulturist for many years, thinking I knew about plants, and I, I was in for a very, very steep learning curve um, when I arrived and started to learn about wild plants. Now, there are certain moments which really stick in your mind, I suppose, when you begin these things, and one that always uh, sticks with me is first seeing wild peonies 
uh, among the cedars of the Taurus Mountains. And there were these incredible, perfect flowers. No one was tending them. They're absolutely magnificent peonies, just growing wild. And that sort of thing I wanted to see more and more of. I was really sort of hooked from those sort of moments onwards. Uh, and this was just kind of the first of, of the many uh, experiences with Turkish flora, of which there are around sort of 9,000 different species. Now, if we start in the Mediterranean with this journey, we've got in early spring, lots and lots of beautiful anemones, very, very common uh, around where I live. And little graphic there gives you some idea of the number of anemones in Turkey and the number in China. China's obviously much larger. So they're, they have roughly the same number. Uh, the diversity is roughly the same. Uh, Fritillaria also very, very well represented in Mediterranean Turkey. A lot of variety in their, in their shape and form and color and kind of hold on to that for when we do go to China and other parts to see how that changes. Um, Turkey and Iran are incredibly significant for fritillaria with, with sort of an, over a third of all frits occurring in that region and relatively, relatively few in much larger China. Um, the Med has great orchids. You have these beautiful bee orchids, very characteristic, essentially a Mediterranean genus, actually most diverse here. Um, each one has a different design to the lip. It's all to appeal to different insects to try and pollinate them. Uh, and we'll see more orchids a bit later on. Irises. Irises are very key again. They're one of these groups that I, I want to focus on. Um, incredibly diverse in Turkey. Turkey really is a wonderful, wonderful place to come see irises. Uh, now, where I am, things like iris and guiculiris get everything going just after Christmas and then a bit later on. You might find iris persica and then these lovely sort of, uh, ir a bit like the flag iris, we all grow these iris junonia, very, very similar to the, to the garden flag iris. They're all growing in the Mediterranean in spring, as are their relatives, the crocuses. Um, Turkey, once again, very, very significant for crocuses. Um, you know, nearly half all species are, are found here. And the spring, great variety of, of different sort of colours. We've got these beautiful ice blue batopiorums, which is a, um, only found in a couple of spots in the Taurus, things like Fleischerite and Biofloris, which is a much more widespread variable species. You'll notice from that little graphic though, there are just two species in Central Asia. The genus quickly declines as we move east. Arums, now I wanted to mention these because they change so much um, as we move east. And you'll see here the Mediterranean and also goes for the Central Asian um, arums always have these space wide open to the sun um, facing up to the sky. Um, and as you, you probably know, obviously that, that really helps to get that very pungent uh, smell they all have to try and attract sort of rotting flies. You'd never want to plant uh, one of these next to your um, sort of living room window because um, you, you really can't open it for about a week. I, I made that mistake myself many years ago. Um, Something much gentler, we have Cyclamen, uh, Cyclamen persicum, Cyclamen grycum here. And one of them is spring flowering, persicum, and the other autumn flowering. We have this, what I call a floral mirror, is very common in the Mediterranean. And depending on which way you look at it, uh, as to whether the persicum is the early flowering or whether it's the grycum, I can assure you the rains have just come here. And the first one to flower will be Cyclum and Grycum. And that's very much the case in the Med. The season sort of runs slightly differently to we might think of uh, in the north of Europe. We have other examples of this. Uh, Galanthus. We have two beautiful Galanthus. Peshmenii would be flowering in the autumn here. And Elwesii carries on well into the spring, depending on how good the snows are. And crocuses, of course, we've got a lot of spring crocus. These are all autumn species. I think some of the most beautiful ones are actually the autumn ones. Things like Matthewy with this gorgeous sort of purple center. Um, Cancellatus and my favorite, Crocus watiorum, which just grows in a, in a couple of sort of canyons uh, near to Antalya. Flowers quite late, um, sort of growing straight out of limestone rocks and the, and the like. Known locally as Antalya saffron. And you can see why with those big red uh, styles sticking out. Now, what is commonly called uh, uh, autumn crocus, of course, which isn't, it's colchicum, as I'm sure you all know. Um, Turkey is very important for that. You've got nearly a third of all species of colchicum, many in the Mediterranean area, and some very striking, big sort of tessellated ones as well. Interestingly, in Central Asia, again, just two species, that another genus that quickly declines. But what's fascinating with these is 
There are two species of crocus. One is uh, basically purple and white, and one is yellow. There are two culture guns. One is purple and white and one is yellow. And you invariably will get the yellow crocus with the purple and white culture gum and vice versa. But you'll never get the, the, I've never seen the two yellows or the two purple and whites grown together. A sure sign that it, it's important which pollinator uh, they're competing for and they're not actually competing with one another. Um, we'll just finish the med with one of my favorites, Pancratium maritimum. It is just very much the emblem of the med, fantastic thing. Just sort of erupts out of the sand in, in sort of September, October. Um, you see all the beach umbrellas in the background there. And, and it does still thrive in parts of the med where people will give it a little bit of room. Now, after the Mediterranean, I was then, uh, I got the chance to go to Eastern Anatolia, normally from sort of Cappadocia um, with all these wonderful sort of ash um, sort of structures and, and eroded ash landscapes. Um, you've got wonderful caravanserais, um, some of them beautifully restored actually. And these were, quite, these were quite important, just a little cultural note because they were spaced supposedly about a camel's ride apart. And they were free to use certainly uh, in, in Anatolia because uh, the government, the, the Ottomans wanted to encourage the trade. And so they offered security to all the merchants coming through and they had these caravans while they went through into Iran and they continued through parts of there as well. And right on that Iranian border actually was um, another fantastic monument, Ishak Pasha, it's a wonderful palace. It's just poised right on the border there overlooking the Silk Road. But the flora um, is very different and I'll quickly just explain a bit about that. We've been just in the Mediterranean. Um, now normally Mediterranean has these sort of mild winters and, and warm dry summers and uh, steppe uh, which is the dominant habitat you can see from that graphic that covers almost all of the Silk Road is slightly different it's it's drier and colder you have maybe half the the rainfall that you'd have in the Mediterranean more severe winters um, still with these hot summers so it's an even harsher uh, biome if you like than the Mediterranean but it unifies this entire region and I'd give you a couple of examples here. Now, um, the two pairs of plants on the top, the pair of plants on the top left and the, and the pair of plants on the bottom left uh, are, are quite similar. Now, the pair on the top left are both photographed quite close to Antalya, where I'm sitting, they're Turkish, and the lower two are both photographed in Kyrgyzstan. But you can see immediately just how similar they are, very similar plants growing a great distance apart. And you have the same situation once again with Aranthus hyomalis and Longistipatata, one in the Tian Shan near Tashkent, and the other one is growing quite near Antalya once again. And then you have these other super plants, if you like, things like Gentiana olivarii and Primula algida, which grow almost the entire span of, of the Silk Road, really a huge distribution over most of Central Asia and well into Turkey. Now, Eastern Turkey has obviously, despite all these commonalities I've just explained, is a distinct flora in each of these steppe regions. It does change, but you just have these similar elements. But the one thing that I think everyone sort of goes crazy for if they come out to Lake Van or areas like that is to see these wonderful, wonderful Onchocycus irises, very showy flamboyant irises. Um, invariably have these like rather small tufts of leaves and these outsized flowers that come up. Um, but they're, they're quite common in Eastern Turkey and down into Israel and a bit into Iran. And the little graphic there gives you some idea of how significant Turkey is for irises compared to China. It has almost as many species in far, far smaller territory. Another example of Onchocycus iris, Iris sari, quite a variable species. These can be e even almost blackish at times and through these lovely sort of pale pinks. And fritillarias. Now we've already seen three very distinctive Mediterranean ones and we have three even more distinctive ones from the central and eastern Turkey. Uh, and I always like to use these as an example to, for, for anyone who goes looking for plants, the importance of knowing a little bit of geology, because each one of these grows on a different substrate. And if you find your substrate, you have a chance of finding your, your frit and fritillaria mikulovskii is found generally on, on igneous rocks, old lavas and stuff like that. Fritillary aurea is always on limestone and alburiana is invariably on serpentine based rocks. So it's quite important to have at least a bit of understanding as to which mountain you might have to wander towards to try and find these plants. Now, the mountains around Ban are, are absolutely awash with, with 
flowers in sort of May, June, you get these wonderful drifts of things still. Still you can find these wonderful orchid meadows, these Anacamptis laxiflorus growing by the million, these water meadows are still there. Fabulous, fabulous displays of plants in the east. A bit higher up in the mountains and we're getting beautiful pink tulips, these very large colchicums uh, come up just as the snow's melted. Uh, and things like anemone narcissiflora, one of these anemones, one of these sort of um, feature plants, if you like, that we're with these key plants we're going to have in this talk. This species again has a huge range. It, this is actually circumboreal, it goes right around uh, the northern hemisphere in one form or another. A um, bit of steppe flora. I'm quite a fan. I think there's some amazing steppe plants. Uh, it, it may look a rather austere habitat to begin with, but once you start looking, you find some real gems, things like Arnebia densiflora these big, big leaved um, alliums and, and surely uh, no one could possibly ignore Philippea tornafortii, incredibly intense red. It's a parasitic plant, it's actually parasitic on the little filigree silver leaves you can see around the edge, that's an achillea, that's what it'll be getting most of its nutrient from, just sends up these outrageous bright red flowers. And we'll finish the step with, with one of my favourites, this is the wonderfully named Chiachuia isotidia, fantastic uh, relative of the cabbages, uh, grows on these lovely sort of um, uh, sort of bare banks in, in big numbers, uh, quite extraordinary uh, steppe plant and only found in a small part of central and eastern Turkey. Now following Turkey back then, Iran was, was uh, very much the flavour of the day. I had the chance to go to Iran three times and um, you can see how the Silk Roads came through. They went through to Tehran and and Espahan and it was very much a key part of, of the Silk Road. You know, you, you had to go through. Iran. Um, so I managed to get to the Albord and the Zagros. Um, a lot of steppe habitat, as I've already alluded to, these fairly dry habitats. Uh, the Zagros below there is a little bit better watered. This is, has a more Mediterranean climate. And it's here in the Zagros that you find these uh, amazing populations of Fritillaria imperialis, in places like Dashtalale, with hundreds of thousands of, of Fritz in flower on a good year pretty much a result of the intense grazing that goes on there and there are many examples of that on the Silk Road. It's a very peopled place, uh, lots of livestock and you, you find many examples of plants where they've selected for um, the bulbs that they can't eat, for example, and, and you get a great proliferation of the things they can't eat. Uh, these beautiful big flowers were growing with their more delicate cousin, Fritillaria reuteri. Now in the albors, three more very, very different fritillarias. I mean, it really is the most extraordinary genus in terms of how it presents itself. Here we have Radiana, which is very much a green version of Imperialis, named the beautiful Gibosa, and maybe Cochiana is perhaps a more typical frit, if you like. These are all in the albors. Now, irises are also very well represented. Many of the same groups you'd find in Turkey. We have the Oncocyclus, Lycotis and Meda. We have the lovely Iris reticulata, and we have things like Iris fosterana. And th that's another of these plants that I've seen by the hundreds of thousands in areas with heavy grazing. I've seen whole herds of livestock walk through big groups of um, the Juno irises or scorp irises and not touch a single one of them. Now, Corydalis, uh, we haven't really mentioned much. There are, there are many in Turkey, but we'll start with this one in Iran, this wonderful Corydalis rupestris growing on this sort of loose conglomerate. Um, a bit of a magnet for bees and, and moths you can see there. This was in the Zagros. And I think when you are when you think of Iran, certainly if you speak to someone who grows alpine, the first plant you think of is Dionysia. And they are indeed very common in the Zagros, growing on these sort of high limestone sort of crags and cliffs, um, yellows and pinks and, and, and the odd white one as well. Wonderful, wonderful plants. In many ways, actually, they represent, uh, I, I showed Primula at the beginning, they're kind of like a bit of a um, stand in Primula, same family. Um, you can't go to Iran without seeing Esfahan and Persepolis, um, fabulous um, architecture, these wonderful blue tiled mosques and, and the like. And the, the, some of the carving of Persepolis is as sharp today as the day it was made, um, well worth visiting if you get the chance to go to Iran. Um, now, I said we were going to jump around a bit. My next port of call, the next chance I got was to visit China. Now, China is obviously the, the objective for everyone traveling on east along the Silk Road. Um, but what we see in China, there's a big, big shift in the climate and a big shift in the plants. The flora of Western China is, is an East, 
East Asiatic one. It's a monsoon climate with wet summers and cool, dry winters, the complete opposite to what we're seeing in the steppes and the Mediterranean. So we see this big shift, lots of things like arasemas, lots and lots of rhododendrons, 30,000 species in, in China, there's at least 15,000 in Yunnan alone. Very, very, very diverse place. Um, and one group that explodes in sort of diversity is Primula. Um, extraordinary, you, you're never sort of away from a Primula when you're in Western China. They like this humid environment. You can find all sorts of different shapes and forms at all sorts of different elevations. Wonderful drifts, beautiful golden uh, Primulas like this, Bulatus forestii. And that was very much the reason I was, was in Yunnan. I was actually, the notion of the Silk Road hadn't occurred to me. I was following the footsteps of the plant hunters. It's a book I'd written a few years before with a friend of mine. And we wanted to see how the land was now, you know, try and find some of these plants, some of these places. So I was following in the footsteps of Forrest and, and Wilson and the like, hadn't considered the Silk Road. Um, little graphic there just showing what I was saying about primulas. You've got more than half of the world's primulas in China, over 300 and a mere seven, maybe eight in Turkey by comparison, far more significant in China than Turkey. Three more examples there to how diverse they are, including the rather extraordinary black primula from a few spots in Sichuan and Tibet. Uh, Some of they occur in wonderful masses as well. Uh, primula sicimensis with secundiflora there. Uh, they love these sort of marshy areas around lakes. Wonderful, wonderful displays. And then Drossacy, their close relative, can do the same. You can find wonderful carpets of these up in the mountains as well. And China's even more significant uh, for Androsacy than it is Primula with three quarters of the world's Androsacy found there. But irises, um, we saw just a few slides back how, how many irises Turkey had. And it's not just that it has more irises um, than China, it's the, the form and color of the irises. China is very limited in terms of the color range and even the form doesn't vary that much, not compared to what you'd see in Turkey and Iran. The same with Fritillaria. There are quite a number of frits, but they're not showing anywhere near the same variety of colors and forms. And look what's happened to many of the arums. Now this, this spathe is coming over to prevent, obviously the, all the rain filling up the spathe, not a problem you'd find in the steppes or in the med. But orchids have changed out of all recognition. I mean, we have many, many orchids in, in, in China, uh, obviously a lot of tropical ones as well. Uh, but in the temperate areas where I spent most of my time, you have these incredible slipper orchids, things like Cypripedium flavum and Yulinensi and these gorgeous spotted leaves, Lichengensis, as well. As well as the very widespread, especially in the high sort of turf, you have these gorgeous big Cypripedium tibeticums. And, and apparently I, I long pondered why there was this dark sort of entrance to the to the house, to the to the lip. And it is apparently to try and lure bumblebees into it's, it's a burrow mimic. And it's to try and lure them into to into the pouch to have a look around and see if it's suitable for a burrow and thus pick up the pollinia and pollinate the cypripedia. Whatever, it, it, if it is true, it does work. They're a very common plant up on the high areas. Not so much so this one, it can be common, but uh, this, uh, this incredible rhubarb, this is an absolutely remarkable alpine, grows very high up on the high screes, uh, Riam Nobili, with a grand view of Dazwe Shan, um, one of the most extraordinary alpines, I think, in the world. And in the scree around where this one was, um, there were lots of these beautiful Corydalis benicincta as well. One of 250 species uh, in China half of the world's total. And they are, again, very, very diverse and occurring many different, especially humid habitats, things like delicate flexuosa and, and hamata. But there are corridors almost everywhere like there are primulas. Another example there, scabarula, which grows on, on sort of granite areas in Sichuan, where you find also this fabulous Carnicaris uh, hookeri, one of the ultimate alpines for me. Um, this was also one of the easiest ultimate alpines because I couldn't believe my luck when these were actually growing right next to the road. Um, not, not something that happens that often. Um, elsewhere, you've got these big grasslands that extend off these granite plateaus. They carry on north, north, north and covered in flowers 
um, asters and 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 all sorts of anemones and all sorts of stuff. Very very flowery in sort of July. Um, things like Lilium lophophorum are commonly found in these grasslands in Carvilias, um, and they extend really all the way up until the edge of the, the to the Silk Road proper. A couple of other plants which I think. Uh, now are really quite synonymous with China when we think about China. Lilies, um, we've all heard of wonderful Chinese lilies. Uh, and Lilium regale um, was again another of my plant hunter ambitions. I wanted to see where Ernest Wilson had found Lilium regale and if it was still there. And I'm pleased to say it is still there by the thousand, um, despite the fact he was digging so many up to send home. And of course, you may know the story of his second visit, the first lot he sent back. Um, rotted so he had to go back a second time and that time he was caught in a landslide very nearly killed but he, he suffered a broken leg which was fortunately reset left him with what he called his lily limp and lily Magali was introduced into cultivation and is very very popular even to this day um, you also have things like this enormous cardiacrinum gigantium as well another plant that surely rings of china and the mountains there are the blue poppies, the Mechanopsis, except they're not all blue. Uh, Wilson again went out to find Integrifolia and Prunicia, the red one, extraordinary red one. And this yellow and red are almost always growing together. Certainly if you go into, into northern Sichuan and into Qinghai, you'll almost always see these two growing commonly together. But the blue species that's with them, and there often is a blue or a purple species, will vary. You can get two or three different blue or purple species and that will change depending on where you are. But the red and the yellow are invariably growing next to one another. One of my favorites though is, is none of those color, neither of those colors, it's a beautiful purple Mechanopsis lancifolia on the incredible Stone Mountain. This is in Southern Qinghai, wonderful area of sort of wild uh, turf uh, where you get these gorgeous uh, Mechanopsis and many other things. And if you carry on just a bit further to the west, you reach Anya Maken Shan, um, big high mountain, big glaciers coming off it. And you can see there the, all the prayer flags, the Tibetan prayer flags. Um, the culture here is very much uh, Tibetan. Although we hear of Tibet, the, the TAR, as the Chinese often refer to it, um, the culture up on much of Sichuan and even north, northern Yunnan is very much Tibetan. And you find these big monasteries quite imposing monasteries and fabulous sort of painting inside and everything. Um, but a very big contrast to how the monks live, bottom left there is, is the sort of accommodation for the, for the monks and they live in really rather, rather basic accommodation. As for the people, they have fabulous big grand houses often and the style of this house changes as you move across Sichuan and, and, and Qinghai. And if you really knew your your clans, you'd know exactly where you were just by looking at the houses because the style is different everywhere you go. Now, if we continue as far as massive Qinghai Lake, that's this big wild uh, lake right up on the edge of the real Silk Road and really where the climate is starting to change. We've moved away from this monsoon climate. Now we're now getting closer to uh, the steppe climate. The flora starts to change again. It becomes a bit more like the stuff we'd see in Central Asia. Some examples here, this shrubby Corydalis, this oxytrope is a very similar one you can see in, in Central Asia, in Kyrgyzstan. Now, at the same time as I was uh, sort of rooting around in China, I had the chance also to go to Sikkim and this, this sort of, you can see a trade route went off from, from the, the main route down into India because obviously these silks were in demand all over Asia. And um, I went and visited Sikkim, um, Principally, again, this was for a plant hunter story. This was for Joseph Hooker this time, who had introduced amazing collection of rhododendrons in, in the, the 1840s, uh, 1850, and including the, the ones shown here. And China um, is very significant for rhododendrons with 650 species, probably more of these very, very showy uh, and very significant woody plants. And we can see another example here, rhododendron Thomsonia, but this time growing with uh, Primula denticulata, something I'm sure most of us have grown at some point. They can occur by the by the, by the million in parts of northern Sikkim, absolutely colouring the ground purple. Some more examples of the rather lovely Sikkimese primulas, which flower in the early part of spring. 
I've never actually been back later on. It all gets rather rather wet and landslidey uh, in that part of the world. Um, it's much easier to, to go around Yunnan. Uh, but of course we go to the Himalaya, don't we? We really want to see the mountains. And I know at least one person listening was with me at this particular moment. Um, and when I galloped off from camp, seeing a tiny square of blue sky, it had been completely obscured and cloudy and raining and snowing and miserable for the entire day. And suddenly this little blue spot, and then everything started to part. And I galloped across the turf and, and had about 20 minutes of incredible mountain scenery uh, as, as, as the sky cleared and then abruptly closed again not long after. And that was the last time we saw the Himalayas on that trip. And it, I didn't have... I had a bit better luck. This is back in Yunnan. With this, this is in the autumn with the sunrise on Kawakapa, the highest peak in Yunnan. And I had gone back to China, uh, not just to see the mountains, uh, but to see the, the gentians and uh, the autumn flora of Yunnan. Uh, we generally, most people go in sort of June, but there's a fabulous flora there in, in September with many, many species of gentian and, and related plants. And it really is surprisingly rich at that time of year. Now, I said we were going to jump around a bit and we've kind of come flying all the way back to the West because uh, in 2000, uh, 2010, I had the chance to go to um, Syria. And um, this was very shortly before it, it all closed down. I was there sort of the year before. And I'm so glad I went because, you know, I think a lot of what's there now, uh, we can't or won't see for a very long time. Now, the, the little map there shows it was quite significant. It was once the main terminus, actually, of the Roman uh, Sir, um, Silk Road goods. Uh, Places like Palmyra were very, very important. Uh, Flora-wise, quite a lot in common with our in, in Turkey. We had the Onkelstarchus iris, lots of other orchids as well there in the Western mountains. And including these wonderful black iris. These are also down into Jordan and Israel, incredible, incredible sort of dark, dark irises. In fact, from a distance, it looks like someone's just thrown a bin liner in the field and then you get closer and you realize it's this magnificent iris with sort of 20 or 30 flowers. Um, and also some of these other really very fine, finely marked species as well. Um, but alas, so much of it, um, along with this, this sort of view I got of Mount Hermon from high above Damascus, Damascus when I went to see Fritillaria harmonius, uh, completely off limits to, to us all now. And that includes not just the flora, but places like Palmyra, the incredible um, Roman site. Um, and the picture I have there of the Temple of Bell is very much just a historical record because um, that was blown up by IS and is no more. And it's a, such a shame that we're not gonna be able to safely go back to this country for, for a very long time, if at all. Um, because there's lots of other things as well, some very old churches, these wonderful beehive houses, and things like this Albara tomb, which was actually one of the hundreds of uh, crusader villages that were built uh, along these sort of mountains uh, along the Mediterranean coast to serve uh, the crusader armies with olives and wine and all sorts, and now they're just completely abandoned uh, and just gradually falling down. Now, it's funny how things do work out, because Syria, when I was uh, in Syria, I was suddenly called back because you may cast your minds back, the Icelandic volcano incident, which sort of stopped all the planes in Europe from flying. And my wife, Bashak, was then um, heavily pregnant with our first son, Merlin, and she was supposed to be conducting a tour. And they said, look, she can't do it on her own anymore. You're going to have to come back. So I flew back to um, Turkey, uh, picked up, uh, joined up with the tour, and that was when we went on to a mountain in Malatya, searching for the plant on the left, the gorgeous Iris Peshmeniai, which uh, I'm pleased to have seen in abundance uh, just a couple of years ago, finally. And that's when I found uh, Bellavelia chrysiae for the first time, and I didn't think much of it at the time. I just, uh, just sort of collected a bulb and then had it recollected by a, a Turkish botanical friend. And, and suddenly in 2014, I got the very lovely email saying they'd named it after me. So that was a, that was a wonderful, wonderful surprise. So Bello Valley Chrissy, I, I only grow on one mountain side in central southern Turkey. Now, at the same time all this was happening, uh, we were just chatting with people and suddenly we, we, it, it dawned on us what we had, that we had this collection of, of photographs and we'd been to all these countries 
And, and the notion of the Silk Road suddenly occurred to us that we could actually produce something about the flowers of the Silk Road, uh, just to share what we'd seen really. But of course, once we'd had that idea, we then had to work out what was missing. We wanted it to try and be rep as representative as possible. Um, and so we began close to home. We began um, in Northwest Turkey with all the wonderful uh, spring uh, crocuses and the like. Wonderful displays of crocus, many different yellow species, these beautiful biflorous forms as well. We have lots and lots of corydalis, lots of galantha snowdrops and wonderful displays of primulas. Wonderful for spring flowers, perhaps none more so than things like cyclamen and cuum, which grows in wonderful sort of carpets in the woods in the northwest. Turkey is very significant for cyclamen, as you can see there. Um, at, half, at least half of the species occur in Turkey and it's a wonderful place to come and see them. And they're generally, generally very common where you do find them. Not so this plant. Uh, this is quite a special plant. I, I always feel obliged to put in this is named for my father-in-law, Adil Guna. Um, it was discovered by his, his son. And um, I wanted to find this plant to show uh, people this plant and was pondering where on earth am I gonna find this plant? And I need to take a side road and be presented by not just the slope with the plants on, but a huge sign telling me proudly, this is where Muscari Ardily grows, um, which is quite wonderful. Wonderful that uh, the local um, sort of uh, council had decided this plant was worthy of a big sign and, and that people were sort of looking out for it and decided it was worth keeping. Um, what was even more heartening was the fact that the first sign was wooden and that fell down. And when I returned a couple of years later, they put this very sturdy metal one up in its place. So they were determined to tell people that this very unique endemic plant, Muscari Ardily, grew near their town. Now, my father-in-law and my, you know, my Turkish family are very much from uh, the Black Sea, the Northeast. This was another area I needed to spend a bit more time in uh, to get some, some more representative photos. And this is a very different climate. Northeast Turkey is very wet. It can rain any day of the year. July is known as the rotten month. Uh, and what it produces is this incredible lushness. Uh, it's in complete contrast, complete contrast to the rest of the country, which is generally much drier. Here you've got tall meadows, tall forests, uh, full of things like rhododendron lutium, and these tall meadows. This is where half of your herbaceous border comes from. Uh, my latest project is working on a book about the origins of garden plants, and you realise that half of your garden came from Turkey. Um, things like Campanulas, Centaurias, we have the Papava orientale, Delphiniums, many, many very familiar plants grow in these wonderful meadows. And most of these meadows are, are traditionally managed, cut with hand scythes or grazed. There's no fertilisers, they're incredibly species rich, uh, and we find many, many fascinating plants there. Geranium silastem is another you probably all know. Eringium gigantium is the forerunner to Mrs. Miss Wilmot's ghost, a very commonly grown plant. And we also have real specials, things like Campanula chorensis, this is a fairly localized endemic, beautiful bellflower that grows on the cliffs in the Black Sea region. And in the autumn, we also have gentians, far fewer than China, admittedly, but we do have a lot of them. Um, things like Gentiana septum feeder, many, many thousands in places uh, where you'd also find this Crocus sharajani as well. The only autumn flowering yellow crocus that occurs in Turkey. All very well and good. Now we, we, we'd covered Turkey, we felt happy about what we found in Turkey, but there was a big hole in the whole project and that was Central Asia. Um, and you can see by, if we just refresh our memories from the, the graphic here, um, it was where all the roots converged one way or another. They came into somewhere like Tashkent, Samarkand, or went round into, into Pakistan, Afga Afghanistan, and then on into China. Very, very significant. Um, and I've marked a few key places there. We've got Samarkand, the Chenshan Mountains, and Lei in Ladakh, where there was also a route that went up um, to the Taklamakan Desert. Um, now, I'd been to uh, Central Asia before I'd been there a few years before and um, I must admit I was forced to do rather a lot of horse riding and then that wasn't uh, I'm not a great rider and and it was back in the days of slide I, I took some terrible pictures and drank far too much vodka to get over the horse riding and, and so it didn't really work out this time I was far more determined and I went first back to uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan 
uh, where these beautiful plants were photographed. Now, tulips and erymurus are very much Central Asian plants. Their senses of diversity are, are in Central Asia. Um, and certainly erymurus, I did show you at the beginning, um, we have two species in Turkey, a few in Iran, and then 40 in Central Asia. This is where they really kick off and become very diverse. And then it fizzles out again. And we just have the one Eryumurus chinensis in parts of Western China. Tulips too, probably at least half, probably at least half of the world's tulips found in Central Asia. Now I began um, this time in Tajikistan. Now the, the Silk Road, you've got to remember, is this, uh, as a region, has always been volatile. Places have opened and closed. Um, wars have started. It's been safe to travel on very few occasions. Um, and suddenly Tajikistan had, had entered a calm period. The civil war had stopped and it had opened for business. And I was in. I wanted to go and see the wonderful spring bulbs there. Uh, things like tulip prey stands and these gorgeous crocus corocoei. Except the day, the day I saw the crocus was, was remarkable because uh, we'd driven up in heavy rain to the pass and really it had been a bit of a miserable washout of a day. And so driving down, the sun had come out, of course, midday, driving down suddenly screeched to a halt with this absolute sheet of gold that was laid out before us uh, and piled out of the, of the vehicle and, and grabbed as many photographs as we could before the sun went down behind the ridge. And of course the crocuses would have closed again. Also lots and lots of anemones, lots of corydalis, and wonderful fritillarias in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, including fritillaria edwardii, but which became a bit of a challenge to reach um, when I was visiting Tajikistan because there was a recent sort of craze among young boys to collect all these wildflowers to sell to passing motorists for very little money. And so it was getting increasingly difficult to actually get groups of uh, plant fans up to these uh, fritillarias. And I since found a wonderful location in Kyrgyzstan where there's a, a fritillaria edwardii reserve and a huge metal fritillaria sign uh, showing, uh, announcing this reserve. And here they use the same age group to police the slopes, uh, chastising their elders whenever they see them threatening to pick a flower. Uh, and so they're very, very secure at this wonderful site in Western Kyrgyzstan. Now into Uzbekistan, that was my, after Tajikistan, I crossed the border, went up onto the wonderful Takhta Karaja Pass near Samarkand. Here there's a whole sort of confusion of Corydalis, this wonderful little uh, primula, one of the very few primulas that grows in step. Um, primulas really don't do step, they need humid places. This one uh, does grow in a step habitat. But I was really after these, I was after the, the, the scorp iris or juno iris, especially iris walliensis, and I found all these beautiful irises in these two countries. A bit later on in the year, if you went up there in June, you'd find masses of these beautiful dianthus, this lovely um, sort of pale yellow delphinium as this more step flora pushed on, this summer step flora, and huge numbers of Eremurus algae. Now this is one of the forerunners to a lot of the garden forms you grow today. This was crossed with Stenophyllus. And um, many of the hybrids from that are what are commonly grown today, but it grows in huge numbers where there's heavy grazing, there's heavy grazing here. And so the Eremurus gets to dominate. Who could resist the monuments of Samarkand? Uh, quite wonderful uh, tile work in places like Red, uh, the Registan and, and in Samarkand, but Shai Zinder, this wonderful uh, necropolis, exquisite work. Much of it has been, been restored and it's well worth seeing as are some of the other nearby areas like Bukhara has wonderful um, monuments and uh, Shakra Subs, the actual birthplace of Timur. You probably all heard of Timur or Tamerlane. He was the guy who kind of instigated the building of a lot of these when he, when he wasn't massacring thousands of people. He was commissioning incredible works of art. Elsewhere though, in Central Asia, um, this sort of big style monument was really very rare. You have this strange caravanserai in Kyrgyzstan near the border with China on the way to Kashgar at Tashrabat. But generally this nomadic culture left very little sign. You would find petroglyphs, you would find some other sort of carvings here and there, but they didn't build nearly as much uh, as, as the more settled peoples of Uzbekistan and the sort of plains um, thereabouts. But this, uh, these 
place I just showed you in the Tian Shan. The Tian Shan is the, the main, the most diverse mountain range in the way of Central Asia. It runs from Tashkent all the way through into China. Um, wonderful, wonderful place. This is a view from the past in Aksu Bagli, which is a, very special because it's been a nature reserve for a hundred years now, and there's been absolutely no grazing in it at all. And what you find is very, very pristine meadows. But before there, we, we just a little bit to the, to the west, right at the beginning of the Chen Shan, we have the biggest Eremurus of all. This is Eremurus robustus, uh, grows very commonly in the, in the foothills uh, near Tashkent. And in spring, you would find also a lot of tulips um, in, in the region as well. Um, just a few here, but I mean, we have dozens of different uh, species of tulip. The meadows I was talking about in Aksujibagli, they really come to the fore in, in June when you have these gorgeous aquilegias, dictamnus, delphin, and many, many other meadow plants. Because there's been no grazing here, but there's very stable uh, meadow uh, communities um, and very, very healthy indeed, and complete contrast to what you'd see pretty much everywhere else in Central Asia. It's a real microcosm of what the area would have looked like once before. Other spring flowers include the fritz. There's Pretty good diversity of, of form here compared to what we saw in China. Not nearly as many species, not the diversity, but still some very, very nice species in the Chen Shan. Primulas and irises and orchids, what's happened to them? Well, there aren't so many primulas. As I said before, primulas aren't step plants. They're, they don't really do dry that well. Um, some do, but most don't. Primula nivalis here is growing near snow melt um, yeah, up in the Chen Shan. Um, the dactyl ariza on the right, the orchid, is also growing in a very wet, humid sort of marshy area. Orchids really, really don't do step, uh, and so we don't find many species. Irises, we've already seen, do pretty well, and, and they include things like Iris coracoei in the Tian Shan. Uh, one of my favourite places here, and there are various reasons for that, it's, it's high, it's wild, it's 4,000 metres, the lake's there. This is the middle of June, and they still have only just begun to melt. This is... This is a pretty wild country, wonderful scenery. But I really go here to see my favorite Central Asian plant by far, and that's Trollius lilacinus. A challenge to cultivate, but in the wild, you see them on a good year by the thousand and, and a quite wonderful, wonderful, subtle ice blue color. Other plants you might find thereabouts, just off to the right from where those photographs were taken were wonderful screes with Calianthemum alatabicum. And then we have a couple of beautifully named things, Desideria flabellata growing on heavy screes and Corydalis fetching koanus on screes um, near to um, Karagol in uh, Kyrgyzstan, another wonderful, wonderful Corydalis. Doing quite well now, but there's, it, when you're trying to put these things together, you, you want them to be as complete as possible. And there was still an area that was nagging me. It was essentially Pakistan and Afghanistan and, and um, they haven't been stable enough uh, to visit, and not as far as I was concerned, the areas I wanted to visit. So um, I couldn't see myself reaching those, but fortunately, um, many of the same plants can be seen in, in Himachal, in uh, northwest India, it borders Kashmir, and you have very, very similar flora. So we use this really to represent these plants, so you really did have a clear picture. Now, the scenery is still spectacular. I mean, you replace the mosques with Buddhist gompas, but it's very much the same sort of thing. Wonderful high dry valleys, spectacular steep slopes, and these incredible high, high passes. Florally, uh, the drier valleys are quite different. Now we're getting more step-like again. We're coming back towards uh, you know, the wetter Eastern Himalaya, where I showed you in Sikkim with all the rhododendrons, that's changed now. Once you come a little bit further north and west, it gets a lot drier. And we have some beautiful roses, for example. They often like these quite dry valleys. And you have these wonderful flower valleys, often called them the Valley of Flowers. Um, they actually are another product of very heavy grazing. You get lots and lots of these oceans of polygonums and geraniums and stuff like that. And these beautiful codonopsis, which look quite wonderful um, when you're lying on your back. Uh, you get some strange looks from the locals when you're trying to take this photograph, but it really shows the bee's eye view of this beautiful flower. Other things, we find the most westerly blue poppy growing, uh, I guess, as far west as Pakistan, uh, Mechanopsis aculeata. I think it's actually one of the nicest 
there are. And then we have other things like uh, Sinopodophyllum, which is all uh, the length of the Himalaya, goes well into China, um, and this beautiful iris as well, just to show the types of iris we're finding at this end of the Himalaya. Now, get on the right path, we've got some other real delights here, things like Salsaria Gazipiforo. That was a real um, target of mine, and I finally found that up on the Rotang Lar with these beautiful little andrososes. And he's got other delights such as uh, Corydalis and very, very common things like Androsoce Simontosa on the Rotang Lar near, near Manali. Wonderful, wonderful place for alpines. Also on that same pass, some gorgeous primulas. Now, primula rosea is a pretty widely grown thing, grows in snow melt, uh, flowering very quickly after the snow is gone. Uh, and then you've got the very delicate, fragrant uh, primula redii just growing in these little crevices with the ferns and the like. Whereas primula minutissima absolutely covers the ground in sort of a veneer of lilac in June, July in unbelievable numbers. We've also got some bulbs. Here's a fritillary just to, to keep us with the frits. Pretty ordinary by fritillary standards, really. Fritillaria roilii. And we have a lily, uh, Lilium polyphyllum, one of the few lilies actually to be at that end of the, of the Himalaya. Um, this actually belongs more to the West Asian lilies. And that's where I'm actually going to finish, oddly enough, because this has been a journey of going backwards and forwards to get all the pieces we needed. And also in these days of digital and, and modern printing, you can get things in at the last minute. And very shortly before we had to submit the final draft, I had the chance to go to, to Northeast Turkey in the early summer to get these beautiful lilies um, and manage to get those into the book. And what um, is interesting is there is a species on the right, Lilium acusiana, fantastic. Big lily stands, you know, sort of as tall as I am, six feet tall, some of them. And you would think someone would have noticed it, but this was not named until 1997. Somehow it had been missed. And I always like to think that that does rather show that despite 2000 years of us going up and down the Silk Road, there are still some wonderful plants there to be discovered if only we spent enough time there. Now that is um, my take on the Silk Road. If you wish, of course, to, to read more, our book has been reprinted for the third time, along with our a companion volume floor of the Mediterranean. Now I'm happy to answer whatever questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, you share? It's been absolutely amazing and a real joy to see all these things after 18 months of lockdowns and uh, yeah. things. So I'll start the questions by asking you in how many countries have you been so far? In the world, total? Yes, in the world, yes. Uh, 62. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I'm a, I have to admit. But, uh, you know, I must admit, I'm not, I'm not really a country ticker. I'm more interested in habitats. I want to visit particular environments. That's, that's more, you know, the, the different biomes rather than the, the stamps in the passport. It's, it's what, what, what plants or wildlife is there, really. Quite, quite. Right. Anyone else? If you have questions, please uh, unmute yourselves. and. Uh... Go ahead. Don't let the beard put you off. Uh, can I ask uh, what sort of you've you've covered the flora? What sort of fauna have you seen? Oh, well, I mean, I've always got my binoculars around my neck, even when I'm out looking for plants, because I, I I began as a birder when I was six, before I even started looking at plants. So um, I've yeah, I've been lucky enough to see a lot of the um, a lot of the bird life throughout the whole region, really. Um, you know. Some of the, the, the mammals, and obviously I know the med fairly well because that's where I am. I mean, I've got bee eaters flying over my house right now because uh, they're on migration through here. And you get to see, I go to areas when there are good flowers, of course, that's when everything else is also at its best. So you've got a lot of butterflies and then everything else. And of late, I'm really, really, I'm far more uh, focused on, lo on looking at pollination and how things are being pollinated. And so you, you notice a lot more that way. I think that's a whole untold side of, of plants is the pollination. I could have added another 15 minutes to the talk going on about all that, but it, it's, um, I, I personally am always looking out for, for everything that's there. Yeah. Thank you. I haven't seen a snow leopard yet, but I think it's probably a bit unlikely. <laughs> 
Simon is asking, what is your next big desirable, desirable plan to see? Uh, oh, there's always a list. Huh? There, were, there were two or three I missed. I felt I missed on the Silk Road. Um, although I'm not sure. I've seen a couple of them since. Um, the only thing I, I always felt I wanted to put in was a Strauskia uh, Magnifica, which is a Campania Lacy, which just grows in a few places. I never got the chance to go at the right time of year for that. But what plant do I want to go and see? Oh, don't know. I, I, I've been lucky to see so much. So I, I tend to sort of, uh, I couldn't, couldn't really say. I'd have to think about that. Let me have a think. I'll come back with the answer a bit later on. I've got a, I've got a chat here. Let me just have a look at that. Yeah, it's moths. Um, I think some of them are. I think some plants are pollinated by moths. Um, of course, not many people, certainly not many botanists are out at night uh, looking for plants. And certainly I've come across things whereby you can't quite understand their strategy during the daytime. Um, uh, Lilium ciliatum from Turkey is one, which I, I'm pretty sure is, involves moths because it, it smells very strongly, but has a very different, color, very different smell and very different coloration to all the other Turkish lilies. Um, and I often see lilies, butterflies often go to lilies. Um, I suspect moths are involved in things like that. Uh, it's probably far more widespread than, than we realize. Where Anyone you, else? Where are you going in Chile, Chris? Where am I going in Chile? Um, this year I was, I'm going from basically from Santiago um, down to the, the Lake District. Are you going up Which, high? No. No, that's when I go to northern Chile. Northern Chile, I go high because we go out to the Atacama. Um, but the southern Chile, you never get any great altitude because it's, it's much lower to begin with. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, they're both... You, you wanted to go high or low? <laughs> I need to go low these days. I've been high with you. Yes, you have. Yes, I know. <laughs> no, these yes. days I have to go low. You remember those roads, I'm sure. Very well, yes. <laughs> I talk about those with George and Liz, and we, we go on about that road, the roads, many I, times. Oh, I know. Himala Pradesh was amazing. It was incredible, huh? I've never seen roads like it. They're still my benchmark, actually, for roads. Uh, Liz, and I, Liz and I hung on to each other on one of those roads. <laughs> we thought we were going to fall down. <laughs> it was a bit, yeah, the last one, I think the last one, as I remember, that was the one that really, uh, that, was, that was incredible. Um, we had to stop for the blue sheep. You remember the rocks were coming yes. down. And, just, and the rocks yeah. came down, yeah. Mm -hmm. But in, in uh, when I go into southern Chile, it's there's one day we go a bit high, but we're not there for very long. You know, yes. it's just you go up there for the morning, come down again. All the rest of it's low, pretty low. I'd love to see the high plants, but I don't. I I'm, can't cope with that now. No. Okay. Don't worry. I'll, I'll keep you well, well, well uh, fed with wine and stuff. You won't know. You'll be fine. <laughs> Nice to see you. Yes, very nice to see you. It's a long time. <laughs> yeah, a few years back now, but uh, I, I still very much remember that trip. So do I. There were only four of us. Yes, yes. Linda well, as well. Yeah, uh, that's right, Linda, yes, yes, yes. I haven't seen the Millses since, but I noticed her articles in the Alpine Gardener Society magazine. We've, we've travelled together a few times, actually. Okay. We've been in Chile and Japan and, oh, and right. Turkey. Uh, yeah, we're on one or two trips. Yeah, we 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 we're on good. Uh, we we get on well. We we often send emails to one another. I've yeah. stayed with them in Canada and stuff. So, yeah, yeah, nice people. Yeah, so very yes. Yeah. Right. Any more questions, or shall we call it an a night? I'm still trying to think of this plan. But um... <laughs> your your next big thing. Yeah, I think I'm kind of, kind of, it may be something a bit obscure. I, I quite actually want to see the, the sort of the, um, all the stuff that's coming up in the, in the sort of um, Richter's Velt in the, 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 the Namib, the edge of the Namib Desert, all these sort of strange succulents. I'm kind of quite into getting to see some of that stuff now. Yeah. Right. Well, questions? thank you once again. Is there another question? Yeah. Take them sleeper. I was just coming in to, to thank Chris and say stunning photography, Chris. 
You're welcome. Yeah, Thank you. It's all crystal clear. Hey, keep off the vodka and keep the good photographs. Yeah, yeah, it does, work. It does seem to work that way. Yes, yeah. I agree. Hey, um, hi, Christopher. Hi, hi. I was wondering uh, that uh, you mentioned that there was many different species in a small area mm -hmm. between the Mediterranean and the uh, mm -hmm. uh, Black Sea. And could it be because while the travelers uh, is uh, collecting seeds and other plants and maybe introduced yeah. to the region? I think there, there would have been almost certainly some very uh, historical transfer of, of some plants, yeah? Um, and the point I perhaps I should have made when I showed the step was um, certainly what I see here. Sure, we have some roadside weeds and things from all over, but these plants really, really penetrate into the into the into the mackey, into the real sort of core habitats. They're not really there. They're just making taking advantage of disturbed ground and the like. And with the step, it's such a tough environment, and and likewise actually the Mediterranean for a plant to come in and oust. A plant which is closely related to, which is what you have here, when you have those pairs of plants which are very similar, mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to, to, to push out your cousin who's already as well adapted as you are. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you tend to find there's not, in, in my experience, not a huge amount of transfer of things so from Central Asia to Turkey or vice versa. It doesn't seem to be. Sure, you've got, as I say, some global weeds you know which are absolutely ever in the world but other than that things like you know the tulips in the in central asia are the tulips in central asia you have turkish tulips but you don't have you know the, the two turning up in in their respective um countries and likewise almost everything else and so mm -hmm. i think a lot of this um this invasives is really sort of opportunist stuff in those marginal habitats rather than getting into the real core habitats. I don't see invasives up in the mountains of the Qian Shan, really, you know, or, or here in the Taurus, I don't see an invasion of, of whatever it is from South Africa coming up there. Um, I might see it down on the beaches here and there, um, but it seems to be that you have well-adapted plants in each area and they really struggle to actually push one another out. That's my theory anyhow. Uh -huh. Right, and each you. environment, each environment, each niche is so fine. That's the thing, because you've got these, these, this pressure of the drought and the heat and all these things. You, you really have to be well adapted. And so the niches are, and in the Mediterranean, even more so, you've got incredibly fine niches, and you can't just push something out because this is a very specific place. Yeah. And so I think that's what you find a lot of uh, right across this region, um, where things have gone backwards and forwards a lot. So they've had a lot of time to actually um, toughen up and, and adapt, to be honest. All right, thank you. That's my theory. We are all impressed with your photography and uh, Sam is asking, what camera do you use? I've always used, uh, when I was way back, Slide, I, I, I was a Minolta fan and, and they went over to Sony and I still use Sony um, and I still would. I, I've always liked, personally, that's, I like the way they, they operate. Um, the, everything's getting smaller these days. There's some incredible smaller, a bit expensive, but some wonderful smaller cameras and, and the optics are better than ever. Everything's just getting, uh, getting that much sharper and easier to use, to be honest, but Sony, my preference. I think it really comes down to what you're comfortable using, what, uh, what system works for you, what, your, you know, what layouts work for you. They're all good, to be honest. Right, and Angela is thanking you from Austin, Texas, and I think we will call it a night. Uh, someone's asking for you. Uh, okay. Yes, I have seen Shmohazeni and Nijilands. It grows up, um, I've seen it below Songkul in, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, yeah, what incredible thistle, grows up this big column, spiny sort of thistle with these wonderful flowers all around it, like a, like a clock. Um, and I see a comment about tulips. Yeah, I know some tulips were bought. Certainly the, the Ottomans, were the, the last I understood the Ottomans were, a lot of the tulips came from Central Asian ones, which were bought across. Um, um, but what you don't see is them growing in the wild. Um, you, you just find the, the Turkish ones here, at least. 
Right. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for uh, listening to Chris. I'm sure you've all enjoyed it. And I'm hoping uh, we'll see as many of you next month when Ian Yang will give a brilliant talk on um, troughs. So from seeing plants in the wild, we'll be looking at how to grow them in the garden next well, month. Very good, yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Good night. Wonderful talk. Bye-bye.